Welcome to the first episode of the Endeavor Charter Talks podcast. We're trying something new this year in our parent workshop series, and we hope you like it. Our goal is to engage parents in discussion topics that are central to education, specifically in our hybrid setting, but we've chosen topics that really affect all families. So throughout the year, you'll be hearing from various staff members and maybe a few other people from the wider community. On the podcast today, our technology coordinator, Melissa Culver, comes to us with 20 plus years in the field of education, specializing in technology and all things digital. And she has homeschooled her own four children across five years. And also one of our two principals, Eric Hagen. Eric has also worked in the field of education, teaching multiple grade levels, and has supported teachers and technology for several years. He and his wife also homeschooled their own children, K-12. In addition to his role as co-principal, he is the technology administrator for Western Sierra Charter Schools in both Oakhurst and Fresno. And I'm Sandra Hammond, also coming to you with 20 years plus in the field of education in various capacities and about a hundred years ago homeschooled my <laughs> own my own uh, two of my children my husband and I together have five grown children so many years ago homeschooling and working in the charter uh, the traditional uh, settings and now in this hybrid setting Today, Melissa and Eric will be talking with us about digital citizenship. Warning, today's topic may include a few discussions that might concern or confuse younger children. Please monitor who might be in the room as you listen to today's podcast. So, Melissa and Eric, before we dive into this conversation, maybe you can define this term for us. What is meant by digital citizenship? I'll let Melissa take, take that definition. Digital citizenship is the study and practice of ethical decision making across all pieces of technology. I really like how a resource by the name of Common Sense Media has broken down the vastness of this specific topic into several categories. I typically gravitate to about six of those topics. Uh, and they relate to cybersecurity, making sure that children make safe decisions on cell phones, iPads, computers, protecting their passwords, and then making sure that they don't overshare information, especially with strangers, across any of those resources. I've had to counsel my children on these topics. Yeah, I would agree with that. Like for myself, I just think about teaching our kids how to survive in this digital world and how to navigate um, what they share, what they see, and for us as parents, how we um, teach them that and how we kind of appropriately protect them as they grow older. And I find that I can't reflect back on my own childhood and say, well, in this situation, my parents did this or my parents did that. This is a very new experience from all of us and we're all learning as we go. In my opinion, it's central that we form relationships with peers. I lean into other parents and ask them uh, for information. How are you responding to this situation? What have your children uh, experienced? And that sharpens how I refine my own at-home policies to guide and instruct my children to keep them safe. I just want to make sure um, we understand this broad topic this is on your radar all the time because both of you are you know this is your profession but if you have to choose just two of the subtopics that you that you named what do you feel is the most important because I heard about six different subtopics so let's define the subtopics we're going to talk about today I and, and I'm thinking it's going to be having to do with safety Two of those specific subtopics that come to my mind readily are media balance and privacy and security. When we talk about media balance, sometimes I gravitate to a dinner plate. We would never give a child an entire cake for a meal. And maybe we can classify that as the entertainment component of all things related to media uh, and digital content. Uh, we would diversify a dinner plate. 
We would have protein, we would have starch, we would have fruits and vegetables. And so when I, when I look at technology, I'm a consumer, I'm a producer, I'm a designer, I'm going to go shopping on the internet, I'm going to make financial decisions on the internet, and I'm also going to head over to Twitter and Facebook and those sorts of resources. So I'm connecting with other humans. So media balance is the idea of balancing out the content that you're consuming or contributing to, but it's also closing the lid and walking away from it and doing other things. The second topic is uh, privacy and security and making sure that students understand the negative long-term consequences of making bad decisions on uh, anything on the internet. If you think it's funny, but the other person does not, it could damage a relationship. If you share information with a total stranger, there could be long-term consequences associated with that behavior. And so making sure that children understand the benefits as well as the consequences of some of the choices they make. I think that's really good. I think um, us as parents, you know, we want to try to teach them those things of having that balance. I think as parents, <laughs> we also struggle with that. I think now I know for myself, finding that balance with uh, in my own life of how much do I look at my phone or not and then I didn't grow up with it and then now these kids are surrounded by it all the time and then also the security um, I would agree those are really important topics to talk about for me within all of that realm I'm really passionate about helping parents understand ways of monitoring that in addition to teaching that so I'm excited about talking about that a little bit more Okay, so what are some of the ways, both as a professional and also as a parent, that you've come into um, difficult situations with this? And what I'm hoping that you'll share with us is what you've learned from it and what free resources are out there to help parents navigate safety and technology. What do you feel and find is most helpful for parents? And, and I'd like to hear maybe some uh, discussion of at-home behaviors and thoughts on screen time in general. The first item that comes to mind is situations that my children have faced and how my husband and I have had to parent through some of those. For example, my daughter was harassed on Instagram by an individual who thought it would be funny to form an I Hate Rachel group posted pictures of her, solicited community hate towards her, and then she received an onslaught of direct messages calling her awful, horrible, vile things and threatening her. In a situation like that, not only was I parenting my child through wise choices on the internet, granted she was the one being bullied, as well as characteristics associated with forgiveness, grace, humility, and then navigating steps forward, not being crushed or destroyed by this experience, and then talking through how important it is that we make excellent decisions on all pieces of technology. Uh, from time to time, my children have encountered unsolicited text messages from total strangers, and sadly, sometimes those questions were related to adult behaviors. So a total stranger randomly selected some phone number, landed on my child's phone, and presented them with harsh concepts that they weren't mature enough to navigate. And so my children knew to not be filled with shame over something that they didn't invite into their device. And then I trained them whenever things like this happen, come straight to mom and dad, and we're gonna block those contacts. In addition, Sandra, I'll try to cover this for just a little bit. What are some free things that we can do? Uh, I have the capacity to block content in my child's iPhone. I can go into the security settings. I can create a passcode so they cannot change those changes that I've made inside of their phone. And I can block certain items that come into their device. So that's a free strategy that I have used 
in one area of digital citizenship in our home. Yeah, I think the Apple um, phones in particular have are really good at being able to lock down your devices so that you can limit um, when they're being used, if they can install new apps or not, and that can be a separate passcode from the normal passcode that is used to unlock the phone. I think it's found under the settings under, I think they've changed things around a little bit. I think it's under screen time, I think is where those settings are found. So if you haven't explored that, that's a good place to, uh, to look at locking those down. Um, there's an app that in our own family, we've, we've tried a variety of things, um, but uh, an app that I've used in my own family is, uh, it's not free, but it's called Covenant Eyes. There's other apps like that. And one of the key things with Covenant Eyes is they have a browser that you can install on your child's phone or even an adult if you want to limit what you're seeing also. But um, within that, you can lock down the phone so they can't use other browsers. They're forced to use that. It also monitors some in the background. Um, you can also install that on computers like PCs or Macs. And it, you can have it where it just monitors the device or it actually filters what's going on there. Um, and then it gives reports that you as the parent can receive and alerts you if they're, you know, it gives you if they're on a computer or if they're using the browser, it gives you little screenshots occasionally of, of things that they're maybe looking at. And it, can, it may or may not be anything of concern, but it kind of gives you a little bit of a, a snapshot and then you can look in more detail. Melissa, are there other things that you've used? Yes. Here in Western Sierra Charter Schools, we have access to a resource by the name of Securely, and we offer, offer this to all of our parents. Our parents are not obligated to use this resource, but we highly recommend it. On our end, we protect and monitor what students have access to on their devices, and we actively watch what they're searching for. But parents also have the ability to download the Securely Home app and they can set their own parameters and protocol above and beyond what we have established. Parents can also receive alerts and notifications or emails indicating what their children have been doing on the internet. I find that this is a great resource and it's free to our parents. To find out more information about this, we have a parent tech support website and under the Securely tab, you can find out more information about that. Yeah, newly released parent support tech page that <laughs> Melissa's been doing it is awesome, has lots of information on there. And so she's been placing all kinds of helpful things and that's one of the things there. So yeah, you make sure to check out our Endeavor website or any of our Western Sierra Charter Schools websites there. Eric, thanks for that shout out. <laughs> uh, within our own home, we have also used a resource by the name of Our Pact, O-U-R-P-A-C-T, and this gives me the ability to shut down content on my child's cell phone. I don't want my child sending text messages at two o'clock in the morning, and so I use this resource to set a calendar or a blocking schedule so that all of his apps will shut off at a specific time. It also gives me the ability to turn on and off apps as I choose. If I discover that he has finished all of his chores and his homework, then I'll turn the video game on for just a short period of time and then I'll turn it back off. We have an Asus gaming router inside of our home where I'm able to establish maturity levels for users and devices. And then lastly, some of the children in our home have a Windows-based computer. And so I have access to Microsoft Parent Safety. And that's another layer of security that I use within my home. Some of those resources are free and some of them are not. There are um, several resources out there available for parents that are absolutely fantastic, but I just have personal experience with those resources. Yeah, I personally, you know, um also have the Asus router. It's really nice that you can decide, you know, either a particular device or you can just shut down the internet for the whole family. And I think, as you mentioned with the Securely app, that for any of the school devices, you, with as a parent, you have the ability to do the same thing through the app to be able to say, okay, we're done lighting the music Chromebook for tonight. One of the other things is the Securely app that we like to use. And um, 
you as the parent, as Melissa mentioned, you can shut down the internet. And you can't make things less restrictive than what we've done, but you can make it um, uh, more restrictive. So if you don't want your child to get on Facebook or uh, go to a particular website that may be allowed with the school, you can actually lock that down. This is a lot of information. I just want to reiterate that all of these resources are, are written out for you on our website. You have access to um, a few slides or at least a list of everything we're talking about here. But I want to go back, Melissa, to this discussion of what's happened to your own daughter because I've heard that before. And I'll tell you, stories like this just make me want to hope there's one long rolling blackout <laughs> I I hate to think that these kids are having to suffer this kind of mm -hmm. bullying and and exposed to all of these other dangers out there you know I'm, I'm thinking electric typewriters are trending and vinyl <laughs> record players or, or you know how about three minutes of screen time per day after you finish your homework <laughs> I yeah time's up everybody outside you know I think that would go over really well with most families right yeah <laughs> we've got, we've got to find a way to balance this I know I know but wow what a lot of work what a lot of work but I'm going to guess that once you get it rolling there's not a whole lot of monitoring once you get some of these uh, things in place and and I'd like to have you speak a little more to uh, behavior certain habits that you have put into place at home excellent thank you yes the topic of cyber bullying is definitely something that is the byproduct of our media rich society when I was in high school I didn't have to worry that someone was going to videotape me um, tripping on a crack while I was walking down the hallway and then post it for everyone to see uh, and then be the byproduct of social hate uh, as a result of that. And so um, inquiry and time around the kitchen table are so vital. Um, it's easy, as a parent, I'll confess, um, to just click into neutral and assume that my children are doing fine. Oh, they're taking honors classes. Oh, they have straight A's. Uh, they're tidy and well mended. They're showering every day. They uh, have a smile. <laughs> Wahoo, they remember deodorant today. You know, all well, of those. Your kids are doing better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> And so um, it really is a focused and purposeful effort to dive into the heart of my child and ask hard questions. And I'm thankful for people in my community who inspire and motivate me to dive into questions that aren't readily on my radar. Uh, and within our own home, we have told our children several times that suicide is never an option. If you are in despair, if you are lonely, if you are sad, if you are heartbroken, these are things that we want to talk about at the dinner table, on a bike ride, on a walk around the neighborhood, or let's hop in the car and go for a cup of coffee. It is central, vital, and essential that we dig into the hearts of our children and we guide them to specific conversations. We let them know that mistakes are totally acceptable in our environment. You are not a failure. You can rebound from any bumps along the way and we are absolutely 100% here to support you. And again, suicide is never an option. Another particular topic that we need to infuse into this discussion is the idea of predators. And um, my son was playing a video game once and I was in the kitchen and I heard him read aloud a question that came through on a chat. And someone had asked him how old he was. And in that very moment, I stopped what I was doing. Uh, my behaviors were probably a little bit exaggerated. And I said, no, 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 <laughs> under no circumstances, absolutely not. And it reminded me how vital and essential it is that I pay attention to the conversations that just seem very natural and, and harmless uh, in situations like that. Sadly, predators use how old are you 
as a gateway question to figure or not whether or not they have found someone that they can chase after or groom or seduce into a particular situation. Fresno County recently arrested 19 local predators who were soliciting inappropriate behavior from children. I located this on Facebook just the other day. They had run an undercover operation. They had several uh, police agents who were posing as young children and they were able to arrest these particular individuals. Sadly, it starts with demographic questions. Where do you live? How old are you? What soccer team are you on? And these little pieces of information are a gateway for trust. And sometimes it moves into, can you send me a picture of yourself? Can you send me an inappropriate picture of yourself? Or sometimes they send inappropriate pictures of them. Of themselves, yes. Very dangerous. And while we don't want to terrify our children, we need to be present, available, listening, and we need to pay attention to the things that are happening in that environment. Yeah, I would also add, I agree with that, and that's that's very scary. And I think both with the predator things, but I think just also in general, like I think we need as parents need to just be aware of what our kids are doing and not just assume you know, we can put all of these protections into place. We can get uh, covenant eyes. We can lock things down. We can do all of these different um, aspects. But um, if someone wants to find a way around, I, I tell parents all the time, tell my friends, like, if they want to find a way around um, these protections that we put in place, they can find a way. There's always a way to find uh, a way to get to a site that maybe you don't want. And so it... That's why I do think it's important, like what Melissa was saying, is to have those conversations, to talk about why it's important, why we have these protections. It's not just to try to limit our fun or, you know, well, you know, your cousin and your family, oh, they get to look at their phone whenever they want or, you know, your friend is doing these things. And so it's important, I think, to talk to the the kids and not to, to scare them, but also to caution them, like, what you share out there um, can be used um, against you, um, whether it's a predator or just another kid uh, from the class. Um, so I think it's important that they're aware of what they're putting out there, that those things, even if it's like something like Snapchat that they think, oh, I just put it out there and it disappears after um, you know, a few minutes or whatever, someone can screenshot that or record that. Nothing that is being put out there you can never guarantee that it's going to be gone. So I think combination of all those things. But as parents, I think it is important that we are um, in conversation with our kids, talking about that. Um, but also, I think helping them make wise choices, um, limiting their exposure to these things, I think is appropriate. Even as they get into preteen and teens, I think even more so um, just helping them navigate what they're doing online how much they're, if you're allowing them to get on social media, how much they're looking at that. Because um, I think for even myself as an adult, but also for kids, I think sometimes we see this like little perfect cookie cutter of all the things that are going on. Or you see your friends hanging out together without you and you start getting sad and all those things are going on. So having those conversations, being involved, asking your kids, you know, Something that for us, just that, you know, that we did for a while is, you know, we'd have the devices put in a certain location, you know, at night. Um, so there wasn't that temptation. Not that I don't trust my kids, but just trying to limit the amount of uh, temptation I think that the kids will have to want to get to those devices. If you're, you know, I know for you, Melissa, you lock down the internet at night, but, um, you know, if they have potentially, I don't know if, if they have data on their phones, I don't know if they're able to still get on, you know, to the internet. We also take the remote controls for the television Mm. and we bring them into our room. We don't want the children to be tempted to 
listen to determine whether or not mom or dad are asleep and then they can tiptoe back into the family room and then watch three to four hours of television it's not a good balance for their brain we we classify that as screen time excessive amounts of screen time can lead to early blindness uh, macular degeneration uh, as well as uh, cognitive uh, changes where the child is then addicted to that stimulation and so we want to mitigate and protect the amount of hours they spend staring at screens yeah i mean you were you know you were mentioning that we don't have the experience as maybe our kids are having but for me i was kind of an early adopter of all things technology and i you know i was play my video games or other things and even in the college uh you know things started you know be a little bit more open and things and i I did get addicted to those games and it was difficult to break. I remember at different points, I'd be like, man, I missed out on this really cool opportunity to hang out with my friends because I was playing this game. It, it really wasn't until like I got married and my I played a game all night and my, my wife's like, what are you doing? And I was like, okay, something has to change. And so I had to cut that out, but it would have been great if I would have learned that sooner, you know, and I think it is important that we as parents are having those conversations sharing our own experiences our own struggles of what we've we've seen and I think you know we can help them kind of navigate this in a world that is just not going away you know I I uh, I've heard that they're they're trying to maybe they have already we will have to get a psychologist on board for this question but this um, term addicted to technology is something that I know they were trying to get into the DSM what is it now 40 something but even if it's not addiction the habits if it doesn't you know meet that criteria the habits I'm seeing more and more and more people talk about being on video games adults male and female for long periods of time so um, wow this is like another layer of things to be worried about now i'm going to guess some people might be thinking children will eventually have to grow up and monitor their own time monitor their own devices so pr protecting them from this is a, um maybe a slippery slope how you know if they're going to get out in the world and how are they going to navigate this but um I think you have some insight on that because we do protect them from other things. And so maybe you can share a couple of things you, you talked about the last time we chatted about. When children are little, it's a natural process for parents to lock down cabinets so that the children don't drink the bleach or the comet or those sorts of things. And then we also put plug protectors uh, in different spots so the children don't electrocute themselves. And if you have stairs in your home, you might put a gate uh, to protect the children from going certain spaces. And so the topic of digital citizenship and parent involvement in these early stages uh, are designed to guide the children away from harmful practices and behaviors at an early age uh, when they're older and they can make wise decisions because of maturity and experience then we don't need the gate up the stairs anymore and we don't need the covers on the electrical outlets and those sorts of things but it really is a shield during those early years where they're incapable of understanding what wisdom looks like uh, and then consistent conversations guiding them to choose wisdom in the years ahead. Yeah, I would agree with that. You know, I think we don't give our kids car keys right away. You know, we, we teach them and we might put on certain restrictions as we're going you know through those processes and so i think it's important like i think um i cringe when i hear some of my friends that they've given their uh you know preteen a phone particularly like maybe a young man or whatever and they don't have they're just they haven't educated themselves on like how to monitor that or put any kind of protections because it is so easy I think to just come across something inappropriate and it just starts a cycle 
um, or even, you know, whether it's inappropriate stuff or if it's even just games. You know, I, I was just meeting with a teacher recently and um, a grandma's homeschooling and really struggling with how to um, get their grandchild to do their schoolwork when they, all they want to do is play the video game. And so it, it can be really difficult to set up those boundaries, but it's really easier if you do it earlier than later, but it's never too late. Like even if you maybe you've, you've gone too far, you've let, you know, have those conversations say, yeah, I know we've let you do this in the past, but I think as a family, let's all try to kind of cut down on our screen time, maybe have, um, uh, those of you that have any kind of religious background you might have a sabbath from technology you know at least one day where you're just like let's just unplug for a day and play board games and hang out together i think that can be a positive for the family to see oh wait this is fun i know my own kids appreciated when we force them to get off those devices and then suddenly they're outside playing or building things or enjoying things even you know our older kids when we establish those parameters and at an early age guide children towards discipline related to technology consumption we're really preparing them for adulthood because we want them to be engaged in community building relationships with others and we want them to be hard workers and if the brain is consistently demanding more dopamine or other natural chemicals that happen when we see the glitter and the glitz and the noise and the success that we're encountering on that piece of technology as parents we're stepping in and we're saying no we need to provide appropriate balance your body needs to move you need to get off the couch you need to do other things. Okay, well, we've had to address the negative aspects of technology and education, and, and I don't want to end that way. Mm-hmm. I want to discuss some of the positives. So maybe you both could describe the way the world has opened up to kids that has had a huge impact on learning I, this is one here we are doing a podcast we're talking about dangers and mm-hmm. safety and security but let's end with why we don't want really to to do away with it why we don't want to go backwards you don't want to just live in a cave in the dark and use your typewriter there are times yeah <laughs> every every time i hear one of these stories and um yeah but there are some advantages yeah, I, I've accepted it's not a passing trend this internet thing <laughs> it might catch on uh, excellent question Sandra thank you so much there are a few items uh, that come to mind where I'm very much resonating with this topic back in 2010 my dad donated a kidney to a total stranger so that my mom could have a kidney transplant she was in end stage renal failure on dialysis and needed a new kidney in order to extend her life. And so I'm extraordinarily thankful for the team of computer programmers who designed the software to ensure that all 26 individuals, a part of that multi-organ transplant chain, all came together on the same day. You needed all 13 donors and all 13 recipients to be healthy and they needed to be biological matches for this to happen. A computer programmer made this happen. So I'm extraordinarily thankful for technology. In addition to that, I utilized YouTube in order to teach myself engineering strategies so that I could learn how to use a 3D printer. With that 3D print and engineering technology, I was able to design resources for the blind community. I used to work with students who were blind, and I designed what are called mobility cards. Uh, I'm obviously not blind, but how do you explain a cul-de-sac to somebody who's visually impaired? Well, I handed them a mobility card and they were able to feel the outline perimeter of a cul-de-sac. Through touch, that conceptual design was formed and they now understand how to be independent in a cul-de-sac. Likewise, I was able to design water bottle holders for our students in wheelchairs and they were able to increase their independence. And for our students who were blind, I was able to design cane tags. If you have four students who are blind in the same classroom and they all set their canes against the wall at the beginning of class, 
how are they going to figure out what cane belongs to them? So I was able to design cane tags. I didn't need a purchase order. I didn't need uh, administrator approval. I was able to print it out instantaneously in order to serve these students. NASA right now is uh, evaluating how they can build on the moon using 3D printers. The future is all things related to tech. And so while there are some uh, situations that cause us to grimace and pinch our eyebrows together out of concern, there is a lot that technology will offer us in the years to come. Yeah, I would agree. I think just as you mentioned, just the ability to find information, to share information, to learn how to fix something. I mean, it's so, I I don't, I don't know about you, but I, I Google all the time, like, okay, how do I fix this, you know, particular problem that I have in my house? And it saves me some money. Also, I learned some things. Um, I think, you know, also I think our kids, as they're, you know, getting excited about things uh, to learn, you know, helping them find appropriate resources that they can learn more about that subject or, or research more about these, uh, these areas. Uh, there is just so much. I mean, I love technology. Sometimes I want to pull my hair out because things aren't working the way they should. Um, but I do think it's important that uh, we rec- recognize that there are a lot of positives with technology. And as Sandra m- mentioned, it's not going away. It's, it's caught on, I think. I guess not. And I think specifically with the pandemic, wow, we were able to continue to communicate via Zoom. And, and other platforms like that. Thank you for joining us for our first podcast. And mm-hmm. I'm going to guess that we have just scratched the surface of digital citizenship. And so we'll be circling back to this, as they say, um, part two coming up again on digital citizenship, but taking another sub uh, subtopic on that. And we'll be listening uh, again to Melissa Culver, possibly Eric Hagen, if he has time. We're pulling him in, uh, having we're wearing several hats, and then Renee Johnson. This podcast is a project of Endeavor Charter School in Fresno, California, part of Western Sierra Charter Schools. Watch for information about upcoming podcasts on this and other educational topics via our school newsletter. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you.